Good morning, church, and welcome. Uh, I want to start this morning with an encouragement from Romans 8, verse 18, where Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, Paul isn't belittling our suffering here, but he's looking at it from the perspective of the hope we have in Jesus. He goes on to say in verses 22 to 25, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our loving Father and glorious Saviour, we come to you as your creation, often fallen and broken, but made strong in your great love. Forgive us our sins and teach us to rely on your grace and to lean on the hope you made available for us on the cross. We thank you for all you are doing to encourage us and to sustain us through this period, for your word, for your church, and for the technology we can use to share fellowship together. Give us fresh hearts and minds to praise you this morning. Spring that hope eternal in our hearts and take glory in your church today, Lord. Amen. We're going to sing three songs uh, that remind us of the hope we have and how we can wait patiently. First, we'll sing Cornerstone, calling us to remember Jesus is the rock of our salvation and praise him as Lord of all. Then we'll sing My Lighthouse, which calls us to follow Jesus ever more closely as he shines through the darkness. And then finally, we'll sing O Glorious Day, which returns us to the theme of salvation, but in the perspective of the day we are waiting for, when the fullness of God's glory will be revealed. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest spring But only trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong in the Saviour's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When 
When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless I'll stand before the throne. Christ the Lord, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Saviour's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ the Lord, cornerstone, Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all.
One day when heaven was filled with his praises One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is he The word became flesh and the light shined among us His glory revealed Living he loved me, dying he saved me Buried he carried my sins far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day One day they let him Up Calvary's mountain One day they nailed him to die on a tree Suffering anguish Despised and rejected Bearing our sins My Redeemer is He The hands that heal nations Stretched out on a tree And took the nails for me Living He loved me Dying He saved me Buried he carried my sins far away Rising he justified freely forever One day he's coming, oh glorious day Oh glorious day One day the grave could conceal him no longer One day the stone rolled away from the door Then he arose over death he had conquered Now has ascended my Lord evermore Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again Living he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried My sins far away and Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day One day the trumpet will sound for his coming One day the skies with his glory will shine Wonderful day my beloved one bring him My saviour Jesus is mine Living he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried my sins far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day Living he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried my sins far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day Glorious day Oh glorious day God is good uh, He is always good Let's pray before Eddie brings God's word to us. Lord, we ask for clear minds now. Open our hearts to hear your word. Stir us to action in making us more like Christ. Amen.
Hello, brothers and sisters. Last week we began to study together 1 Peter, and today we're picking up the text in chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 3 to 12. Remember, this is a letter which Peter is writing to Christians who are going through many trials, just as we are going through a trying time at the moment. And in chapter 1, verse 3 and following, Peter writes this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, how would you begin a letter to somebody who was suffering? I write many such letters, and I usually begin with something like, I'm sorry to hear about your trouble. Peter doesn't do that. He starts with, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's striking, isn't it? We tend to focus downwards on the difficulties that we're facing, but Peter shifts the focus upwards to God, who has given us new life in Christ. And that's pastoral wisdom, because this is always the way to find strength and comfort when we're facing trials. Not to focus on the problems, because that will simply crush us in the end, but rather to focus on God, because that will give us a foundation on which to stand. So what does Peter see when he focuses on God? Well, he sees two things that will help us in every trial we face. Firstly, that our trials are not forever. And secondly, that our trials are not for nothing. They're not endless and they're not pointless. See how Peter unpacks this. Firstly, that our trials are not forever. Verses 3 to 5. Peter writes, verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You can feel Peter's excitement pulsing through those words. Surely in his mind, he's going back to that first Easter experience. Think of Peter running to the tomb of Jesus and finding it empty, and then meeting the risen Lord multiple times. And now, years later, he writes to these Christians and says, it's true, it's all true. And it's not just true, it's life-changing. You see, Peter knows this from experience. Remember how when Jesus died, Peter was a broken man. His life was in pieces. But the resurrection of Jesus put Peter back together again and gave him new life and hope. 
And now he's reminding us that we too share in this life transforming reality. We have a living hope, he says, because Jesus has defeated death for all his people. That means that whatever your trials today, if you are a Christian, your future is not to be dead in the grave, but to be raised with Christ. We can face the future with confidence because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shares his victory with us. And with his victory, we receive, verse 4, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Now, surely at this present time, we know how precious this is, because the coronavirus has hit the economy hard. And our pensions, yes, my pension, I've been checking, our pensions and our stocks have nosedived. Well, God is sovereign over these things too. We don't enjoy them, we don't welcome them, but we know that God is sovereign over them. But hey, what Peter is saying to us is that as Christians, we have a trust fund that can't be touched. Our inheritance is life with Christ, and that is something that will never, ever lose its value. And God is watching over us, says Peter, to make sure that we inherit. This is what he writes in verse 5, that God is shielding us by his great power. Now remember that Peter writes this as somebody who himself had fallen very badly. And then he discovered that God would never let him go. And now his heart is bursting with joy to know that God not only guards our inheritance for us, but he guards us for our inheritance to make sure we inherit, ready for that grand unveiling that will be the blessing of all Christians when Christ returns. Now let me ask you, do you share this living hope? Every day we encounter a world where death seems absolute. Every day in the news at the moment, we are hearing mortality statistics. And we do this in the context of a culture that has no good news for the dying, no comfort for those who are about to pass from this world. What is the message that new atheism has to say to people? That's your lot, mate? Not much comfort there, is there? How different is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Remind yourself every day, if you're a Christian, that you have a living hope and a glorious inheritance. Because when you grasp this, you can't help saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of Christ's resurrection, we know that whatever we go through today, our trials won't last forever. We have a living hope. Now, here's why you need to know this today. Because in this world, there will be trials, and we need a hope that sustains us, that enables us to face these trials, and even in the light of that hope, make some kind of sense of them. And that's what Peter goes on to demonstrate in verses 6 to 9. He's told us that our trials will not be forever. Now he tells us our trials are not for nothing. Now, if the person sat next to you on the sofa watching this is nodded off. Give them a sharp dig in the, in the ribs at this time, okay? Because this is so important. Brothers, sisters, my dear, dear friends, I plead with you. I beg you for the sake of your sanity and the sake of your soul, listen carefully to what Peter writes next. Don't just listen to it. If you've got your Bible in front of you, look at it as well in verse 6. This is what he writes. See it for yourself. He writes, Now, for a little while, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These words seem to have dropped out of some people's Bibles, and as a result, there is a gaping hole in the middle of their theology. And that hole leaves them vulnerable, not only to Satan's attacks, but to their own silliness. And let's face it, there is a deep reservoir of silliness within all of us. 
we need to let what Peter writes here plug this hole in our theology before we get into real trouble. So let's focus on what Peter says, and then we'll return to why it matters so much for our lives. But first, we've got to understand it carefully and accurately. Look at what Peter says. You ready to do some thinking? Okay, let's go. Verse 6, here is Peter's message. Even though we rejoice in our future hope, today we may find ourselves grieving because of all kinds of trials. Now, Peter refuses to limit the, either the variety or the severity of those trials. All kinds of trials, he calls them, because what he's about to say is applicable to all kinds of trials, no matter what we face. Well, immediately, we want to know why on earth would our loving Heavenly Father let hard and horrible and difficult things happen in the lives of his children? Well, Peter tells us in verse 7, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, Peter says several important things here to help us understand what God is doing in our lives between our conversion on the one hand and our home call, our death, our going to be with him on the other. What is God doing? He saved us in Jesus Christ. One day we will be there in his immediate presence. But what's he doing now in this present time? What Peter says in verse 7 is the explanation that makes sense of our current Christian experience, and we need to grasp it. Now, Peter says several important things in this verse. Firstly, he says that our faith is incredibly precious. It's worth more, much more than gold, which people in this world seem to value so much. I don't know if you're sat there wearing all sorts of gold bling at the minute, but you know how people in this world think gold is worth so much. Peter says your faith is worth far more than gold. When the time comes that you are dying, whether it is dying of the virus or dying of anything else, if you've still got your wits about you, I promise you, it will be clear to you in that moment that your faith in Jesus Christ is worth infinitely more than whatever you're, you've got in the bank that you're about to say goodbye to. Your faith is worth much more than gold. Now, because of that, it's important to know that your faith is the real thing, that you've got genuine faith, not some kind of false imitation faith. And so Peter goes on to say that trials test our faith to show whether it's the real thing. For example, right now, our faith is being tried by the COVID-19 virus, and our faith will either be exposed as false or it will be proved genuine. Even the removal of the scaffolding of our church life, the fact that we can't meet in the way that we usually do, we can't enjoy the things that we usually enjoy together, even the removal of that scaffolding will play its part in either exposing our faith as false or proving it genuine, whether we've got a living relationship with God which is sustained and which sustains us through this time. When all this COVID-19 business is over, will your faith have evaporated or will it have been proved genuine? That's what Peter is saying God is doing in our lives at the moment. But trials don't just test the genuineness of our faith. Peter goes on to say that trials actually refine genuine faith and make it stronger and purer. He compares it to the testing of precious metals and the refining process. You know, when precious metal is refined, it's heated and the heat separates out the impurities. All the muck rises to the surface and it can be skimmed off. Well, says Peter, trials do that with our faith as we respond in faith. And what's left is the real thing. We begin to shine more brightly so that God's reflection is seen more clearly in us. If you say to yourself, well, can that really be true? I would say to you, just think of the lives of the elderly Christians who are really godly. 
those ones that you you know of that you've been indebted to as i have through the years how do you think they got that way their lives have been refined through trials and it shows now in 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 the beauty of jesus that you see in them and what's the end result of all this testing and refining well says peter it is praise and glory and honor when Jesus returns. Praise, glory, and honor both for him and for us because we share in his kingdom. And yet, says Peter, here's the wonderful thing, even despite all these trials, the dominant note of the Christian life in the present time is not grief, it's joy. That's why Peter adds in verse 8 that even in the midst of trials, we're filled with what he calls an inexpressible and glorious joy. How can that be? It's through our relationship with Jesus. Even now we've tasted his love and we love him in return because, verse 9, we're getting what we prayed for, namely the salvation of our souls. Day by day, through our trials, we're growing to Christian maturity. Isn't that what you prayed for? Father, save me. Father, grow me. Father, make me more like Jesus. Well, says Peter, that's what you're getting. You're getting the answer to your prayer through these trials. You are receiving the salvation of your soul. Now, brothers and sisters, that is an incredibly important piece of theology for making sense of the Christian life. It's what Paul Tripp calls in a rather neat phrase, uncomfortable grace. That's a very good expression. We need to take hold of it. Uncomfortable grace. Grace is always good. It's not always comfortable. And this concept of uncomfortable grace seems to be missing from many Christians' understanding. And the result of that is that, sadly, they suffer much unnecessary confusion and heartache. Trials come into their lives, and they think that God has deserted them or that God was never real in the first place. They have no idea why a loving God would let them face difficulties. And yet, surely we have just seen, if you've been looking at your Bible, you've seen it for yourself. God tells us plainly that in his love and mercy, he will refine us. And we need it. Every day we prove by the evidence of our lives that we still need to change. We still need to grow. We so easily deceive ourselves. We so easily overestimate ourselves. We so easily rely on the wrong things, give the loyalty of our heart to the wrong things. So God takes us to places where we reach out to him and we say in desperation, Father, I need your grace. I need you to rescue me. I need you to detach my heart from all this rubbish that I give my heart to and to reattach my heart to you. Please do that. Now, when God takes you to that place, that's not God abandoning you. That's God moving towards you in love. He does that to rescue us from ourselves and from our idols. Here's the bottom line. Trials never, ever get in the way of God's purposes in your life. Trials are the means through which God fulfills his purposes in your life. And it will be worth it. Because God is doing something that will end not in our destruction, but in our healing. These trials are not for nothing, says Peter. They are leading to praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That will be the most incredible moment. And God has chosen us to be a part of that moment. And right now, he's preparing us for that moment. Now, you may be thinking, okay, Eddie, I hear it. I can even read it in the text for myself, but I don't feel it. Truthfully, I feel much more upset about my trials than I feel joyful about my salvation. What's wrong with me? Well, I think Peter anticipates this kind of 
reaction from us. If you're feeling like that, brothers and sisters, I am not unsympathetic to you. I'm right there with you because many times I have felt like that. And many times in the future, I'm sure I will feel like that because I have a fickle heart. We, we think to ourselves, OK, if all this is so true, I should be feeling great. But actually, I feel lousy and I'm struggling with my trials. What's going on? Here is Peter's response in verses 10 to 12. He says to us, in effect, but it, it's not enough just to have a, a kind of nodding acquaintance with our salvation. We've got to go deeply into it. We've got to ponder it. We've got to gaze on our salvation until it captivates our hearts and takes a hold of us. You see, the deeper we dig into the gospel, the more strengthening we find it to be. The gospel is not just a handful of doctrines to be believed with our heads. It is a series of, of endless insights into how the truth of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ now applies to our lives individually, specifically, and to the very details of the circumstances that we are facing. That is how God gets the gospel into us. And what Peter says in verses 10 to 12 is, we could learn an awful lot from the Old Testament prophets and from the angels. We need to become like them. What does he mean? Well, consider the Old Testament prophets. Peter says they searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. What Peter is saying is that those Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the people that we're familiar with, they often wrote things they couldn't fully understand, but they prayed and they racked their brains trying to get a better grasp of the glories of our salvation. Peter goes so far as to say in verse 12 that their ministry was actually intended to serve us. And yet many of us pay far less attention to the glories of Christ than they did. And then there's the angels, verse 12. They are longing to understand better the riches of the gospel. It's beyond their mind to grasp. Picture the angels and they're saying, how can it be that our king... God's son should go through such suffering for those people. Who can explain this to us? If only we would ponder the question that every angel in heaven asks. Amazing love. How can it be? You see, we've got to gaze deeply into the gospel. We've got to meditate on it until our hearts are captured by it, ravished by it. Now, be honest. Are you doing that? You say that you hear these things, but they don't touch your heart. You're more upset about your trials. Well, are you like the Old Testament prophets? Are you like the angels? Are you gazing on the glory of your salvation and focusing on it? and giving every moment you can to delving deeply into it? Well, oh dear, I thought not. Well, in honesty, I'm not like that either. And that's why I struggle in the same way that you do. But what Peter is saying to us is, think of the prophets, think of the angels, continually gazing into the gospel with awe and wonder. And Peter is saying, my dear friends, you'd better do this too. Otherwise, you won't be able to cope with your troubles. See, every day we need to remind ourselves of how great is the salvation we've been given and then apply its, its, its many, many facets. So wonderful. Apply them to the details of our life. That's how to find stability and even joy when you're going through trials. Well, that's how Peter begins a letter to people who are suffering. He dives straight into the resources that are ours in the gospel, and he shows us that our trials are not forever, and they're not for nothing, because we have a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and our present refining is preparing us for a glorious inheritance kept safe for us by God. 
And it's grasping what God has done for us in Christ, not just saying yes with my mind, but so pondering this, so, so soaking in it that my heart is captured by it. It's that that puts a praise be to God into our heart. Well, it did that for Peter. May it do that for us too. Let's pray. God, our Father, we confess that sometimes we struggle with your purposes for us. We have our own plans and they rarely include being refined. So we thank you that there will be a day when every battle with temptation will cease, every idol be destroyed, every trial will be over, every weakness in us will be healed, and there'll be a place for us at the banquet table to celebrate our inheritance in Christ. Until that day, keep holding us and keep growing us by your spirit for your love's sake. Amen. Here are two questions for reflection and action. You can consider these on your own, or if you're joining in a Zoom meeting with your life group, or you've got family members with you, consider these together. Here's the first question. Since your faith is worth more than gold, how are you going to nurture it? Got that? Since your faith is worth more than gold, how are you going to nurture it? And here's the second question. In what way is God refining you at the moment? And how is the resurrection of Jesus shaping your response? In what way is God refining you at the moment? And how is the resurrection of Jesus shaping your response? The peace of the Lord be with you, dear brothers and sisters. God bless you.